It's incredibly brave of you, actually, to step up and talk about something that is so deeply personal to you. And you, throughout your life, you're not really one to wear your heart on your sleeve, really. You're not, you're not that emotional. You've said yourself that you've sort of seen emotions as a bit of a weakness in your life. Yeah, well, from the, the background, I'm from a council estate, and you're taught to not show any emotion, don't talk too much, um, just kind of be hard-nosed and get on with things. And then I went into a career which was very much the same in the dressing room, guys, macho, ego, and any sign of weakness emotionally, I would be the first one to, to dig that person out. I don't want them in a change room. I want to win, and he's not going to help us win. So I've always been closed in that sense, and I've had to flip that on his head in this situation yeah. by showing emotion, especially for my children's sake. I've learned to act, I've, I've got to show emotion, crying, if you need to cry, cry, mm. to show them that it's all right. And how do people see you, especially in that? sporting environment, how did they view you? Did they say, oh, he's a bit cold? Yeah. Did they? Yeah, I think uh, even my family probably the same thing. I don't really... Sh I'm, I remember I signed for United, biggest day of my life in football, and I remember Alex Ferguson saying to my mum, is he even happy about this? Because I just don't... I don't... I found it really hard to show him. I used to find that as a weakness, and I didn't want people to think I was weak in that sense. I had to st stand tall and, and look as strong as I could to go out there and perform at, at the best way. And, and that just followed me throughout my life, really. And my dad was very much like that. And I probably got similar traits in that sense to my dad. But this situation, you've just got to become yeah. softer. You're opening up. You're doing absolutely the opposite to what you've always done. Yeah, well, I think that was the main reason for doing this, this, this documentary, in that I wanted to help myself to open up, to help my children, to then help other people. And I, I didn't really do this for any sympathy or anything. They are the core reasons, I think, to help other people to talk. And what I've learned along the journey is that talking is so important. And again, talking wasn't really part of my makeup emotionally. But my, my children need to see me talk, need to feel emotion. And I think any advice for anyone else, what I've learned through this process is that talking definitely does. It doesn't, it doesn't make the pain go away, but it, it helps a lot. Well, the, even with the cancer itself, you found that difficult to talk about, even, even with Rebecca, because mm. she was diagnosed, first of all, in 2013. She went into remission, back, life back on track, things returning to normal. During that time, before her second diagnosis in 2015, she tried to address whether, what would happen if it came back, and mm. you didn't want to talk about it with her. No, because um, defeat was never really an option. I, ne I, I never looked at defeat in my, in my work life. You didn't think about defeat, you just think about winning, and all I thought was getting over this. We've got over the first hurdle, we'll continue. So looking at any negative option wasn't an option for me, really, so I used to just kind of steer away from it. There were moments you spoke about the odd thing here and there, but, again, advice for anyone, that if, you do, if you're coming into this or you, you, you've gone through it, talking at that point when the person's still here, because you will have many tormented nights after, um, thinking about, I wish I could have said more, I wish I could have done more. So it... it you, you end up, you hurt yourself if you don't talk and... Did she want to talk about it more? Yeah, but I would just shut it down. I'd, I'd close the conversation because I didn't want to get emotional, didn't want to think about the, the worst case scenario. And, um, because I thought that had an effect on me <laughs> and then obviously have an effect on the children. who were very stable, a very structured kind of lifestyle. So you didn't, didn't tell anyone how ill she was, did you? No, you so the, the, the plan at my last year at Man United, and then at QPR as well. Um, I had to tell the managers because there would have been days when I've had to have off and, I, and we're just at short notice to go into the hospitals and stuff with Rebecca. So, but I'd, I'd, I didn't want to put that burden on other people, on my teammates. And to be honest, you're going into work was a, a kind of bit of respite for me. Yeah. I could go there and that was an hour or two where I would kind of not forget about it, but you can kind of put it to over there and, and breathe a little bit easier in the, in the training ground. And it happened so quickly, and the second diagnosis within 10 weeks, sadly, mm. she, she passed away. So to suddenly then face that mm. and face the fact you've got these three children now that are entirely your responsibility, how do you even begin to bring up that subject? How did you tell them? Yeah, well, that's, that's probably the hardest point um, after she put or before she passed away that you got to tell your children that you're going to go home from the hospital today and, and never see your mum again that's like i wouldn't wish that on anybody but difficult yeah um but you just you're just thrown into a situation where you've got to deal with <laughs> the school run for instance do you know what i mean and and your appreciation for mothers and 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 how they cope and how they deal with 
the school run, just just doing that. I mean, I, I thought I was, I was taking and playing a big part in the school run by taking my kids, kids to school every day. Um, but I soon realised that there's so much more that goes into a school run that mums do that we kind of, as men, don't even consider. So <laughs> just preparation the night before and making sure that the, the school uniforms are out, the books and stuff are all in the bags, the breakfast is ready, you know what breakfast you're going to do in the morning type thing. And I woke up the first time they had to go to school and before I knew it, they were late. And you're sitting there, you sit down and think, I'm, what, what am I going to do? How do you, how do, you yeah. do this? But so there's, so it doesn't matter how much money you've got, if you're in the public eye or not, I think we all come under the same type of stresses at that point. And it's, it's having a network around you, having the ability to reach out to Child Briefment UK or my local uh, uh, guys with, with Jigsaw. These are great people that, that you, you have to reach out to and talk to. It's, 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 it